The following is a presentation of the Belly Up Sports Media Network. Hello, everybody, and welcome into another episode of Rising to the Occasion. We're so happy to have you here with us, ready to ride with us and talk some sports. We're going to get into the NHL. We're also going to talk about the NBA. We're also going to jump into UFC, which we haven't talked about in a little while. And we're also going to talk about college football that we've been talking quite a bit about here lately. Um, but we're going to talk all about all of this kind of stuff. Uh, I mean, all of these sports, man, it's it's just an amazing time in sports world because we've got all of the bowl games when we come down to uh, the college football world. And then, of course, we've got off-season news coming in with college football. And then, of course, with all of the other sports, it feels like they're really starting to kick in. We've even got MLB uh, off season really kind of getting us and catching us by surprise but we're not going to talk about that one yet tonight we're going to talk about all of these other sports but before we do first i better mention our sponsor for this episode and that is seat geek seat geek is an amazing app where you guys can go check out the best way to buy your tickets whether you're into live events like uh, sports which we're going to talk about or you're into theater or music whatever the case may be seat geek is the best way to get your tickets for any of these live events. And I'm talking live events from just really just about anything you can possibly think of, even parking tickets. Uh, Jeremy and I even got parking tickets the last time that we went down to the college, uh, a, a college football game in, in Norman. We got our parking tickets there, and it was so easy, so easy to use. Uh, SeatGeek makes it very easy to get any kind of tickets, especially when you're talking about live events, because you can go in and they have an amazing color code system where you can see green, yellow, or red, and you look at those color coding systems, and it tells you exactly what kind of deal you're getting on the seats that you're trying to pick. And it also makes it very easy because you can see the entire blueprint of everything around you, and it's also very secure, very uh, it, it gives you a complete peace of mind when you're buying your tickets because you know exactly what you're going to get and you know for a fact that you're going to get those tickets no matter what. And we also partner up with SeatGeek to give you guys an amazing deal because you can go to SeatGeek.com or download the SeatGeek app and use code R2TO for $20 off. Again, that is code R2TO at SeatGeek.com or by using the SeatGeek app and get yourself an amazing $20 off. SeatGeek has some of the best prices on on tickets, no matter what kind of event you're trying to go to. And on top of that, we're giving you guys an amazing deal by going to SeatGeek.com or using SeatGeek app and using code R2TO. Again, that is code R2TO at SeatGeek.com or the SeatGeek app. Guys, it is an amazing site, the best way to get your tickets. And it's also really easy to sell tickets on SeatGeek as well. So again, check them out at SeatGeek.com or by using the SeatGeek app and using code R2TO. I'm going to go ahead and bring in one of my co-hosts for today. We're also going to have uh, Blake come in later. But Jeremy, how you doing, man? I'm doing pretty good. Then catching up on some news, obviously, since there's been so much going around, not just in one particular, just going around with any any kind of sports related thing just for today. Um, had a day off, then got to work tomorrow, obviously, then just catching up on a lot of things but going into what we got today obviously you as you mentioned we're gonna bring up the nhl which is always a pretty nice topic for me to talk about going to the stadium series not trying to jump guns here but um between stadium series and like you said we got some big ufc fights coming along on the card then it's nice to see the ufc back in prime time for their card situations then i know blake will obviously be here when he gets here he's got some other commitments that he's obviously fulfilling too but once he gets here obviously we'll get him up to speed but josh we got a lot of talk to so i'm gonna cut the chit chat let's get rolling with it yeah man i mean uh, let's start off with the nhl because like i said we're gonna start off with the nhl and get rolling in with that and <clears throat> excuse me sorry uh, to be honest i like i told you jeremy man I'm, I'm i'm beat i don't know what it was about the day uh i had i had a test i had to take earlier today and I, I think just the stress and everything going into that just kind of wore me out. I am tired as could be right now, but we're going to fight through it. We're going to get get some good content going out in it anyways because we love sports, and that's exactly why we do this podcast. But starting off with the stadium series, uh, like you said, with the Devils going against the Flyers, uh, two teams that looking back into last season, I think the Devils, you could definitely take them and put them in the series. But then now the Flyers this season kind of looking a little bit better. The Flyers really have, have turned on a, a lot coming into this season. They've looked a lot better overall. Um, and just overall, I think this stadium series has always been a really fun one to look at. Playing a game, whether it be outside or however however they end up doing it. 
Uh, it, it's just always fun. And it's doing it in a different stadium, a different surrounding, a different setting. This one is going to be in MetLife Stadium. It's going to be between these two teams, the Philadelphia Flyers and the New, New Jersey Devils. Uh, a really fun game to look forward to. And I'm, I'm sure we'll talk more about the matchup itself. But just talking about the stadium series uh, and, and what all goes into it, I think going to MetLife Stadium, personally, when when you brought this to my attention, uh, that it was going to be in MetLife Stadium earlier on, I mean, I, I just thought, man, this is an amazing atmosphere to put this in, bringing it to New York, putting it in MetLife Stadium. Uh, I, I think this is going to be an electric game. But then on top of that, just the stadium, the atmosphere, I, I really hope this can be one of those atmospheres where you sell out a lot of these these seats and a lot of these tickets and seeing everything that goes into this game. I think this is a really fun uh, venue to hold this stadium series and especially with everything that goes around it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you look at some of the previous stadium series that the NHL has been played in. I know if Kermit for I know they played in Boston, they played in Minnesota, then just just even getting to play in a stadium series game. That's that was that would be something I would love to check off my bucket list and just even getting to go and watch, obviously. But between these these two teams going talking about the Philadelphia Flyers and the New Jersey Devils, this is definitely going to be a really interesting game. Now, I know in past games that we've seen stadium series, if it was the Pittsburgh Penguins versus I believe it was the Buffalo Sabres, but um, correct me if I'm wrong, they play in an absolute blizzard. And that's the only thing. Thing that I could definitely say that would be a negative thought about trying to play outside in the stadium series. But playing at MetLife, that would definitely be something that I would sincerely cherish every single moment, whether you're walking just to the arena or if you're actually on the ice just looking at the crowd once you're actually playing and just hearing everybody go nuts just because – it, don't get me wrong. When you go to a hockey game in general, when a, score, when a team scores a goal, it already gets nuts. But – in this persistence, you've got a lot more fans that are outside, and then you got other attractions like the pre concert. I believe it was the Jonas Brothers. They just got announced that they're going to be performing yeah. for um, that concert, and that's be, that's another thing that you'll be excited for. Get a pre concert show before the main show, obviously. Then just the overall atmosphere that, like I said, that would be second to none for me. But like I said, going back to these two teams, I think this is going to be a pretty good game between these two teams. Watching the New Jersey Devils play last night against the Boston Bruins, then they went into overtime and the New Jersey Devils beat the Boston Bruins here. So obviously that's going to get the New Jersey Devils some momentum and just keep going here leading up towards that stadium series game. Now looking on the other side of the of the table for the Philadelphia Flyers. I know they've had their name obviously here in, in the recent past, just because Philadelphia has definitely been playing better hockey than when they first started the games here, just because they were definitely struggling at the beginning of the season, but now getting their feet rolling, it, that was definitely something that obviously like we talked a little bit about, just you guys got to get your feet rolling, then get the chemistry going. Then once you guys finally set everything aside and just get your feet going, I think this is going to be a prime time for the Philadelphia Flyers and the New Jersey Devils just for just this overall atmosphere. And it's definitely something that I would take into it. Josh, what would you have to say about this situation and what they're going to be doing? No, I mean, I, th- I think you said it well. And then on top of that, just seeing, I, I think the, I, the atmosphere of playing these in different stadiums, I think brings something new to hockey. And, and, and it's just an exciting time. Every time that we have these stadium series, I know you and I always talk about you know how how fun it is, uh, and and I can remember, I can't remember how many how many years ago, but I can remember whenever they played this uh, at the Big House up in Ann Arbor, and and seeing games like that, uh, and now we're bringing it to MetLife Stadium, I think that'll be a lot of fun. I've, if I remember correctly too, I think MetLife Stadium can be indoors, but they can open the top, uh, and I might be wrong on that, but seeing that, I mean, it's it's still a football stadium, a football arena you know and and that's something that's kind of fun to bring to the sport i I always think that's always fun i I think no matter what stadium it's in no matter how how it's it's brought regardless of the situation or or what stadium it's in just bringing it to a new arena and and especially if you can bring the fans to a different location Um, because sometimes you bring in different fans or or new fans or even just fans of that general area and i think that's a lot of fun i think the fact that they're kind of keeping it close to New Jersey. I, I think that makes it a little more fun for New Jersey fans that they can travel to a different stadium 
and, and try this out, you know, try cheering for their team in a different stadium, but still kind of feel like the home team. So that's, that's kind of a cool aspect to the game. I think this is going to be a lot of fun, and we're de- definitely going to talk about this matchup when it gets closer to time because uh, I believe this is on February 17th. Uh, whenever this matchup is going to happen. So we got a little bit of time, but just the fact that it's announced, and then like you said too, the Jonas Brothers performing before the game, I think that's going to be a lot of ton- a lot of fun to to see. So, I mean, I- I'm really excited. I- I'm-, I'm always excited for any kind of matchup in the NHL, but especially the stadium series. I think that's one that's always uh, kind of one that you look forward to a little more just because it's kind of Mm-hmm. Maybe a, what are we? Maybe a quarter quarter away through the the season right now. About that, yeah. yeah. And so it's it's a fun time knowing that it's right about this time of, of the year, and you're going to jump into that series. Uh, but man, it's going to be a lot of fun to see. And I think these two teams are two teams that are teams that have a very good shot of making a deep run in the season as well. So uh, it's it's going to be fun to kind of see that that series go down. But let's jump over to the Edmonton Oilers because if we remember. Earlier on in the season, uh, just not too long ago, they fired their head coach. So seeing kind of the drama go around the Edmonton Oilers, now they have an opportunity to match the franchise record for the most consecutive wins as they host the Tampa Bay Lightning, uh, which is actually tonight. So for you watching, uh, you're, you're going to hear maybe some ignorant takes of ours if we're wrong on this take. But for us, it's tonight. And so looking at this, the Tampa Bay Lightning, they could match uh, and, and actually break a, a, or I guess they would, yeah, they would match a franchise record uh, and they could possibly hit a win streak. Uh, so the longest winning streak that they've had during their five championship seasons was eight, uh, which they did three times through 83 to 84 on their way to their first Stanley Cup. Uh, and then they did it again twice in 84 and 85. So they have a chance to match that tonight. Uh, I, th- I think that's something notable about this franchise, and especially considering, like I said, they just fired their head coach. Now they're on a winning streak that could lead to matching their franchise record for the most consecutive wins. That's pretty big for this franchise right now, and especially looking into this season, because in the beginning of the season, when they were kind of just looking really rough, everyone's possibly looking at this team thinking that they might not make it back, especially after losing your head coach. You might, you might not make it back on that winning pattern and make it to the playoffs. How are you going to adjust? How are you going to look into the rest of the season and fix some of the problems within? And right now it feels like they've really fixed a lot of those problems. How are you feeling about the Oilers? Are they going to match that that winning record and possibly go on to, to beat that winning record to move to nine and then ten? Uh, how, do, how do you feel right now about the Edmonton Oilers? Right now, I feel pretty positive about the Edmonton Oilers up in oil country. But, I mean, you, you got to give a lot of credit to, obviously, Connor McDavid and even Evander Kane. I mean, just the entire Edmonton Oilers roster and just the organization, just what they've done. Like you said, them firing their head coach a lot earlier than what everyone expected. And now them getting their feet rolling, which is obviously something that you – just mentioned and we talked about what is this team going to do are they going to be a superstar team or are they just going to be an oil spill pun intended but i mean um looking at this looking at this kind of this kind of offense for what the edmonton oilers have bring if you just give Connor mcdavid the puck he's bound to determine to eventually get the puck in the back of the net but i mean even looking outside of that for um, just the overall situation. You got to think about this going against the Tampa Bay Lightning team. That's that's still pretty electric. Just talking about them. I mean, obviously with Kucherov for the Tampa Bay Lightning, then just um, everybody on the on both rosters has just been playing really really strong here. But the big thing is that I always look into this perspective is. Don't get yourself in that situation where you're going to keep drawing yourself penalties. Just because if you get yourself into penalty trouble, then it's just going to be a really, really rough road. I mean, the last thing anybody wants to do is get Edmondson on a power play situation where obviously we've all seen Connor uh, Connor McDavid skate, almost like Connor Bedard. But, um, I mean, Connor McDavid, if you haven't seen his skating ability – Go on YouTube and just watch Connor McDavid skate in practice just because he really looks like Usain Bolt out there. And, I mean, realistically, if the Edmonton Oilers want to get this new – or tie this record, 
like I said, they got to play physical, smart, and stay out of the penalty box, which is, I guarantee you, what every coach in the locker room preaches. But at the end of the day, it's just going to come down to that. And if if Edmonton gets too far beyond track with Tampa Bay, just because I know their goaltending has been been really, really good for the for the season so far, that they need to they need to find whatever it takes to find that weak spot in the goaltender and going even to towards Edmonton, it's in that same situation just because if you see a team just lagging, then it's just going to affect from the players in front of the goaltender, then it's going to get to the goaltender just because he's just going to get worn out really easy and then he's just going to be drained and who knows, he can let in a simple shot that you would think that anybody could save, but it just happened to trickle in or whatever the situation is. But for the Edmonton Oilers, I sincerely think they can do this. They just got to play smart. That's going to be the big thing. And just give Connor McDavid the puck and Evander Kane on the backside of it. So just play smart here. Yeah, I mean, looking at it too right now, you, you've got the lightning ahead of you. That's that's the, the most important game right now, especially if you're thinking yep. about this streak. But then the next game, going against the Panthers – who have been just on fire this season, uh, and, and they've looked really good and carrying over that momentum from last postseason. And then after that, you've got the Islanders, which I think you have a little bit more of a chance against. But uh, overall, let's just talk about just the Oilers. I think I think, th- think the Oilers, they started off on a losing record, obviously, and it just seemed like a lot of drama going around with the team and a lot of blame being put on the head coach. They finally end up firing him. And now they're looking at a winning record right now. They're sitting at 13 and 12. And they're looking much better. And like you said, just give Connor McDavid the puck. And and it's it's funny to, to that you you mentioned almost mixing him up with Connor Bedard too. Both yeah. you know, high, highly uh highly uh uh you know envied skilled for yeah, very high skilled too, high, highly envied draft picks and, and high draft picks at that too. And they they both come into the league. And both have just an amazing skill when it comes to the ice, and very similar in their play style too. So it's it's very funny they're 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 both named Connor, spelled the same way, uh, just both obviously last names, different regions. But uh, yeah, I mean, looking at Connor McDavid, what he can do with the puck uh, right now too, and 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 he's sitting there. I believe last time I checked was like somewhere around ten goals, twenty eight assists, or something like that. Just just an amazing season so far. And he's putting his team in a better position right now, especially on this win streak. So if they're able to, to win tonight, uh, I, I think that can be a really good boost for this team overall. And then on top of that, seeing where they can go after this, being able to win that win streak uh, and, and beat that win streak and, and just keep on winning after that. Uh, and, and that's really all that matters, just one night at a time, one game at a time. Being able to win night in and night out is a very difficult thing to do, but uh, these these oil this Oilers team they they look like they're very capable of doing just that, and they they look very capable tonight to be able to beat the Lightning, who aren't doing bad whatsoever this year. I mean, they're they're looking like a pretty solid team as well. Uh, so I mean, it, it's it's going to be a really fun one, and if they're able to kind of beat that franchise record, I think that's one thing that would really be able to give a lot of confidence to this team just showing themselves what they're capable of doing. You know, hey, if we can win eight and then nine, go on to win a 10th game in a row, you're you're making yourself feel a lot more confident about where this season can go. Absolutely. But like I've, like I've said before, any kind of situation where you get in these high streak games, who cares if it's eight games, who cares if it's 16 games or whatever the situation is. You just got to look at it, this perspective, and just say, just go into the game, you win, it's one and know. That's it. Go to the next week. And if you win, two, you're 2-0 two in your head, but you're still 1-0. and Just keep that mindset going, and then you can find that positivity rhythm. And then hopefully, hopefully you can get that record beat. And I wish nothing but the best for the Edmonton Oilers or any team in the NHL. I wish you guys nothing but the best. But, I mean, at the end of the day – I wouldn't be surprised, Josh. I think the Edmonton Oilers are going to knock this off, and they can definitely keep that that sh- that win streak rolling here. Yeah, yeah. I think looking at tonight's matchup too, and seeing where they come in with the hot streak that they're on, they're obviously the favorite in my mind, uh, and I, I think mm-hmm. they can definitely at least match this. Going on to the next game, though, man, the Panthers. That's going to be a hard one to be able to beat that franchise record. 
But if you're able to yeah. able to do that, going against the Islanders, the matchup right after that, being able to to push it even further than that to push it to ten, a, a ten game win streak. Let's let's not overlook that in the NHL. That's a very tough thing to do, and so and especially for a franchise record and and extending that re- record out to ten even nine. I, I mean, th- this is a very impressive record that they're on, especially, like I said, with the drama going around this franchise right now and looking at the Panthers recently getting rid of their their head coach and moving on to that. So we'll, we'll see. And I think uh, this will either sound very ignorant of what we're talking about right now to listeners who are listening on Friday, or it'll sound like we knew exactly what was going to happen. We maybe recorded this after the game had ever have even happened. But Let's go on to the Blues because the Blues, another coach being fired midseason. We've talked about this, man. It's kind of crazy. We've seen several coaches being fired midseason this year. Uh, and now the Blues firing their head coach, Craig Berube. And, and the Blues, right now, they fall into the third worst in the Central Division, uh, which is actually the seventh worst in uh, the West with a record of 13 and 14. Not a terrible record starting off your season because you have a lot of room to improve, but we've talked about this with other teams that have fired their head coach here early in the season. Uh, You know, looking at this, I don't think this is a terrible decision to try to figure out what you want to do with your franchise right now while you have time to improve and go forward. And especially, obviously, every team's goal towards the end of the season is to make the playoffs and, and, and pushing towards that postseason. So I don't think that's a terrible decision right now. But looking at, at, at uh, you know their head coach right now, Craig, uh, he, in his sixth season with the Blues, he had a record of 206 wins and 131 losses. I, I, I don't think that's a terrible record looking at that. I think that's a pretty, pretty solid record in the NHL. And his win total ranks third in the team history. So he, he registered for 24 playoffs and 51 postseason games. Not the greatest in postseason, but he was, he was able to get them to the postseason quite a bit. And like I said, third in team history for total wins as a head coach. Uh, this, this is kind of a, a one of those head coaching firings that I look at and I kind of scratch my head wondering if it was the right decision. And this one just doesn't feel right to me, but maybe the, maybe the team feels that there's more of a reason than just the overall wins. Uh, you know, uh, is this one of those firings that you look at and you're f- feeling the same way, same way as I am, or are you, are you kind of more on board with the St. Louis blues and where they're, they're feeling with this firing? I'm more on the same boat with you, Josh. Once I heard he was released from the team and I was, I was honestly mind boggled when I heard that they, they fired him just because I did the same situation. I pulled up my phone. I looked at his stats. And I'm like, he's on above 500, obviously. Then looking at this perspective, he led the, he led the St. Louis blues to a Stanley cup. And yeah. I was, Back in I was mind boggled. Right? Yeah, exactly. It's in the 2022 it. season. Yeah. Then that was, that was the big thing that got me really surprised is you get, you get a team that's just recently won a Stanley cup and you get this coach that obviously knows what it takes to win a Stanley cup and coach these players into the right direction. Then out of the blue, it honestly felt like that all of a sudden the St. Louis blues just happened to cut him loose. And then now he's cutting foot loose. But I mean, I don't know what is really going on in the franchisee. I don't necessarily know if there was some talk in the locker rooms or if the GM just wasn't liking what he was seeing, which would kind of be really of a head scratcher for me, just because like I said, this is a coach that has definitely seen the positive side of winning games here. I mean, obviously every coach is never going to be perfect in their lifetime. That's the most abundant thing you would ever see. And if you if you say that, I'm going to call you a liar flat out to your face. But, I mean, this is definitely something to where I, I don't necessarily know what the St. Louis Blues organization was doing, but now looking at their new head coach, uh, he, he's actually making his debut tonight. So, realistically, this is just going to be – what we're going to see here, I don't necessarily know if he's going to make some big time adjustments with the team or if he's just going to talk with, get a whole group group meeting with the team and break down a, a projective of saying, here's what we're going to try and do. Then obviously watching some film, I didn't like these adjustments or I didn't like these plays so we can make some adjustments, excuse me. Then they may work or they may, they may be, 
they may be a really, really bad decision and regret. So realistically, I, uh, I don't like this, this call, but like I said, I'm a guy who just sits behind a TV and watches the hockey game instead of being behind the bench and playing, I mean, coaching the team. So I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm right there with you, man. I just, I don't understand this firing. Uh, Cause like you said, it's, it's kind of funny. Like it was just a, a, a couple of seasons ago that they won the Stanley cup uh, and, and then seeing what he was able to do. And, and like you said, over a 500 record is one thing, but sitting there at well over a, a winning record, I think almost, you know, yeah, what, what is that? Over 74 games, Seven, 70, 75 games yeah, over 75 a 500 games, record. I so, I mean, it just the fact that you're well a, a, above a winning record and, and looking good with this team, I don't know, it was, it was really questionable to me. Uh, and, and obviously there must be more to the story than what we're getting with just the winning record and just from what, what we can see on paper. Um, so it, it's it's hard to tell exactly what goes into this. But obviously this season just wasn't going how they expected it to go. And I can understand that. I can understand one season not going the way that you want and acting quickly on it and trying to change that the trajectory of that season. And so I think if you if you were planning on looking and into this season and making a decision this season, I, I can agree with making that decision right now rather than waiting later in the season when it, it's too late. But I, I don't know. It's just it's it's hard telling right now with this this season uh, or with, with this this coach and seeing what he was able to do. But uh, let's go on to a game that happened on Wednesday night. Uh, looking at the Penguins and seeing what they were able to do. I mean, this was just a really crazy game and and seeing how it all went down. Uh, I, I, I just told you just before we started this too, it was against the Canadians uh, and, and I was trying to watch this game. This was one of them, one of them that was popped up on, on TV for me here in the hotel uh, as I'm staying out of town. And so I figured why not watch some hockey and I watched this game. It was a very close game going back and forth. And, and it was a really fun game to watch just because of how much back and forth there was throughout this whole game. Uh, you know, you start off in the first period, it just seemed like the Canadians were going to win this game easily. And seeing where this game was going, it was 3-1 to one in the first period. Penguins come back, shut them out 2-0 to zero in the second period to tie it up. And then the third period was just all defense. Uh, and I was already starting to get tired by that point. It was a late game. But then it goes into overtime and then getting into into a shootout. And this just this doesn't go into just one shootout. It goes into 12 rounds of shootouts. Not just one, not just three, five, seven. No, it goes into 12 rounds of shootouts. Uh, I, I, I told you before we started, I fell asleep in maybe the second round of shootouts. I just couldn't stay awake anymore. This was an absolutely insane game to watch seeing where it was going and how late it was. I remember several years ago uh, being with my parents at a game where it was a Musketeers game and it was a playoff game. So it just went into several overtimes. It didn't go into a shootout, but it went into several overtimes and it was like one o'clock in the morning. And I I remember my parents just being ready to just pass out, like, please just end the game so we can go home and finally the musketeers win and there was like no energy in the entire arena we just darted out the doors like let's go home <laughs> good job we won uh and, and and that's just kind of the feeling that i get from this game uh and the, the penguins sitting there at 13 and 12 uh, and then on the other side the, the canadians sitting there now at 12 and 13 so the winner of that game it feels like a little bit of a momentum boost putting your your team in a winning record um but man 12 shootouts how are we feeling about this game, man? 12 shootouts. That is just, I'm not going to lie. I fell asleep during it too, just because I, I, as much as I wanted to stay up and watch the entire shootout, I was, I was like, yeah, I was stupid tired. And then I just finally, my head hit the pill and I was D U N E done. <laughs> but I mean, looking at this, do you know how much energy you have to sustain just to, make it through overtime and then just just go through a shootout. It's, it already takes enough energy to go through three rounds, but then you get beyond that. That's just the next level of stamina that these guys just endure. 12 rounds, that is uh, 
that one, I hope the pop concession stands weren't closed just so <laughs> everybody can at least stay awake during that situation. But, I mean, I've been in some long hockey games, and the the most recent one I was actually up in Sioux Falls, it was for a Sioux Falls Stampede versus Sioux City Musketeers game. And um, it was a playoff game situation as well. And we got up there a little early, and we grabbed some we grabbed some lunch, and then I remember getting up to Sioux Falls at around – Three thirty, four o'clock, and they went into triple overtime, and we got home at two in the morning. That was one of those same situations that you're like, I am ready to go home. Obviously, when we got there, the arena was full. Then by the time we left, there it felt like there was maybe fifty people left in the arena. But I mean, it, just seeing this kind of atmosphere and just getting to witness. 12 rounds of a shootout. The last time I can see something like that was honestly, I think the world juniors for USA and Canada just keep going and going and going. Then even before that, the Washington Capitals versus the New York, your New York Rangers way back in the day, then that went on for forever. Then, um, but literally you, you can't complain about not getting your money sport for this kind of a situation. You pretty much had two full hockey games wrapped in one, but I mean, this is definitely something that you, once you see it, you'll obviously understand what it takes for uh, for determination, stamina, and all that fun stuff. And you just gotta you just gotta prepare yourself right, and that's what all these players do, just so they don't get physically drained. Heck, if I if I had to tell you honestly, if me and Josh were in that situation, we'd probably passed out on the bench behind the coaches and taking a nap. But I mean, realistically, twelve shootouts. I love it just because it shows true talent and what these players can do and then see how many times our jaw hits the floor or if they're actually hitting the post or just missing wide of the net. And if they're missing wide of the net, you need to do some shooting practice to say the least. Yeah, and and, and a couple of shout-outs in this game too because I think, if I remember correctly, Sidney Crosby scored a couple of goals that was kind of on that that, that uh, comeback. And so he, he definitely led his team. And, you know, obviously we expect that from Sidney Crosby, but then Jansen, uh, Jansen Harkson, right? Is that his last name? Mm-hmm. Uh, he, he ends up uh, getting in there and he ends up being the one to to win it. Uh, Harkins. I, I think I said Harkson. Harkins. Jansen Harkins. Yeah. He ends up scoring that, that game winning <laughs> in, you know, in, in 12th overtime shootout game winning goal finally to, to go ahead. And the sucky thing about that is I don't think that actually goes on your overall goal record, does it? When you win in shootouts? Uh, no, it does not. No. <laughs> yeah. So here you are. You're the, you have the, you're the saving grace. Leagues, We've been we going know. for 11 shootouts now, 11 rounds of shootouts, and you finally step in and take over for the 12th one, and you go and you score, you win the game, and it doesn't even count as a score. It doesn't even count as a goal on your stat sheet. Uh, that, that's a that's a sucky feeling. I feel like to to go for that long. You know, your your entire team is just ready to just get out the door with a win. You finally do it for your team, and it doesn't even go on your stat sheet. Yeah, to me, that's just I I could be wrong too. I'd have to look at at the website for how they do stats, but I'm ninety percent sure that they don't count it. Just. If I had to have that, that would definitely be a stat that I would love to see for every individual player. Because for all we know, heck, Sidney Crossy probably has what feels like a thousand goals <laughs> just in shots for all we know. But well, I mean, because in, in overtime you it. still get it because you're still going four and four, five on five, something along those those scenarios. You know, where where you're still playing in a normal, you know, you're in a normal atmosphere where you're playing against the defense and and just a normal mm-hmm. gameplay. Whereas yeah. in that situation, I, I'm pretty sure it doesn't count against your stats. And I understand why not, because it's just one-on-one. It's not really a part of that normal game atmosphere. So, you know, I can understand why we don't count it. But in a, in a game like this where you're going to 12th overtime, I'm counting it on your stat sheet, man, because you deserve it. You finally sent the the fans home. That's exactly what they wanted. Uh, so, you know, congrats to him uh, and, and Jansen Harkins for – for stepping in and finally scoring that goal, uh, that that's that's a that's a big time goal right now, you know, and, and and in that moment too, to finally score, get your team out with a win, and send everybody home. Um, but man, that's that's absolutely insane. But let's let's jump to some of the standings right now, uh, and I'm gonna go by conference just because I, I think 
uh, you know, looking overall at the, at the conference. And I know last time I think we did top five. We're going to go to just top three right now. Uh, over in the Eastern Conference, we got Boston, New York at number two, and then Florida Panthers at number three. It felt like Boston was going to fall off of that top spot there a little while back. They had a little bit of a losing streak, bounced back and started winning some games, got back in their rhythm, and, and they're right back to where I feel like they really were towards the beginning, beginning, of, the, beginning of the season. Man, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to put my words together here, but uh, uh, the Rangers sitting right there with them. So the Bruins are sitting at 27 and 18. Uh, and, and then the Rangers are sitting at 27 and 19, uh, which looking at the standings too, I'm trying to understand exactly how the point system works to keep the Florida Panthers behind them because the Florida Panthers are sitting at 28 and 17. So one more win with the same amount of loss or, uh, you know, one less loss uh, and, and how the points can't favor them a little more to bump them up ahead. Um, but overall, the, this top three is a really tight top three. And the way that each team is playing feels like a team for for really the Boston, for Boston, New York, and Florida Panthers. All three of these teams feel like they could be teams that can make a really far run in the NHL right now. Absolutely. But, I mean, I'm in the same boat as you. I want to know for point stipulations for the NHL and just – getting the point situations right because I would be in the same situation as you. I would almost be favoring the Florida Panthers in the situation having one extra game on top of the Boston Bruins. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, talking about the Boston Bruins here a little bit, I know I said it a little earlier that the Boston Bruins, to me, they just haven't seemed like the normal bees that were that we've you know seen what? in the beginning half of the season. I, I'm sorry. I actually, I actually was looking at the wrong columns whenever I was looking at these standings. So the Boston Bruins sit at 18-5. and five. The Rangers sitting at nineteen and seven, and then the Florida Panthers sitting at seventeen and nine. That makes way more sense uh, overall because if, you know, looking at it, <laughs> I was looking at total games played, uh, and and I had the columns moved over just wrong. Um, but that makes a little more sense. But still, all three of these teams right there neck and neck with each other, uh, and it, it if you actually watch each team and how they're playing too, it just feels like they they all have a chance in keeping themselves right there in the mix of all, of all of it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Then, Josh, which division were you talking about, the Atlantic division? Uh, right now, this is just the Eastern Conference as a whole. Oh, it's just the Eastern Conference. Okay. Um, I thought you – do you say top three of each each and everybody? But, I mean – Yeah, yeah, overall conference. At, I mean, I mean, if you look at, at divisions, I think right now the Atlantic, Boston and Florida are right there in the top of the Atlantic, and then uh, New York's right on the top of their division, the Metropolitan. So, I mean, overall yeah, yeah. looking at it, uh, it's 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 really close in the in the conference, and then of course for for different divisions, I feel like w w especially whenever you look at that Atlantic uh, division, seeing Boston and Florida and how close they are. Uh, I mean, it's it, overall the Eastern Conference is looking like they are the toughest conference right now because even when you go down the list, you've got Toronto and the Islanders and Detroit and Phil and Philadelphia, and then down below that Washington and, and New Jersey. Overall, I feel like that Eastern Conference as a whole, no matter who comes out of it, is going to be the toughest conference. Oh, yeah, definitely. Then, I mean, just literally talking about the conferences, I mean, or not even just conferences, but overall for the NHL, like – your your New York Rangers are definitely looking looking pretty promising. Say at nineteen and seven, you can't complain with that. Then obviously, um, even just going to a different team, going back like talking about the Atlantic Division. I know he hasn't gotten his feet rolling just necessarily yet, like we're used to seeing for the Detroit Red Wings. Patrick Kane's name hasn't been like they've talked about Patrick Kane a little bit, but we're still waiting to hear for that big moment of fame to where Patrick Kane makes an unbelievable play. Then. All of a sudden, maybe it's the post for all I know, or he actually does put it in the back of the net. But, I mean, I, just looking through this Eastern Conference just overall, this is definitely – I do agree with you, Josh. But then, like, talking about, so, like, the other side for the Western Conference, you got the Colorado Avalanche, the New, the Winnipeg Jets, the Dallas Stars, then even the Vegas Golden Knights that we everyone's always talked about. Then, to me, they, well, and, they have the best record. To, to name the top three, I mean, since you're going over to the Western side – to name the top three, of course, the the Golden Knights on top of the entire league all, all together. They are the best team right now. So the Golden Knights looking really good. They're sitting at 20 and 5. I mean, they're just an inc a crazy, incredible season that they're putting together. But then on top of that, uh, a team that, again, you and I talked about this team earlier on in the season, the Vancouver Canucks looking pretty good at 19 and 9. 
And then, of course, the Colorado Avalanche. We talked about them earlier on in the season. They were kind of one of the outcasts that we talked about. We have no problems with them starting off slow because we know who they are. We know that what they're capable of. And, of course, with the leaders like uh, Kale McCarr and guys like that on their team, uh, I, I, we, we know who, they're, what they, who they are and what they're capable of doing. Obviously, I think the Colorado Avalanche is always going to be up there in the top of that that conference. But the Golden Knights, I, I think, with them, with how good they're looking, and then on top, and and then you go just below them with the Canucks, a team that I, I don't think anyone was really talking about the Canucks having a chance of winning the Western Conference, but they're looking that, like that kind of a team right now. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I understand we can talk so much about the Vegas Golden Knights in the situation, but just anybody in that division, you really can't necessarily sleep on. I mean, unless if you're the San Jose Sharks, that's about it. No, I'm just kidding. But um, for all we know, the San Jose Sharks, they could be number one in three months for all we really know. But um, literally in that Pacific division, you got a lot of Canada teams, obviously talking about the Canucks, talking about the Oilers, talking about the Flames. Then literally it just seems like half of the Pacific division is – Canada, but I mean, obviously, I'm not trying to say that for any disrespect, but I mean, looking at this division, it's all these divisions are close because looking at it, Vancouver is 19 and nine, like you said, the LA Kings are 16 and six, then the Edmonton Lewis are 13 and 12, then the Calgary Flames are 11 and 14. Like, this is definitely something to where any of these teams can all of a sudden have an absolute breakout four or five weeks and see those people that are just slightly above them, just pick them apart and just hope that they can, the team that they're trying to increase over is just getting their favor. Then they can just bump up one spot. Then they can maybe bump up two spots. Then hopefully just keep clawing their way to the top. Just because look, anybody in this division, anybody in this league can all of a sudden come out of nowhere. But I mean, realistically, I don't know how you're going to stop the Vegas Golden Knights being with that high of a caliber team, only being at 20 and five. That's just, that's, I'm not saying it's absurd, but I mean, this team is just overall electric. And I still stand what I say with when I said this a long, like I was going to say a long time ago, but earlier in the year that the Vegas Golden Knights, I wouldn't be surprised if they pull a repeat here in this situation, they can bring another Stanley cup back to back to Vegas here just because I think everybody wants to see how amazing that their on ice crew and their videography crew does of uh, putting on a show. Then of course, if you guys didn't see it, the Vegas Golden Knights for this year, this last season when the Vegas Golden Knights won the Stanley cup, then obviously bringing out the big slot machine, trip, hitting triple sevens, then raising the banner to me. That was pretty stinking cool. Yeah. Then, that was, that was a, I, a really cool know. way to, to bring it out too. Yeah, I mean, it, it's Vegas, baby. You got to go out with a bang here. So, I, like I said, you got to stop the Vegas Golden Knights is my big thing. Absolutely. But let's go ahead and move on. Uh, but before we do go any further, we got to talk about the holiday season and what you guys have to look forward to in the holiday season because it's a really busy time of year. With this busy holiday season, you might be looking for nutritious, flavorful meals to fuel you on a jam-packed day. Factor, which is America's number one ready-to-eat meal delivery service, can help you eat well for breakfast, lunch, and dinner with chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time and save on track with, or stay on track with your healthy lifestyle while take, and tackling all of your holiday to-dos. What you can do during your holiday season is you can cross meal prepping off your list because you can use Factor. Skipping the meal planning, grocery shopping, chopping, prepping, and cleaning up, you can get Factor's fresh, never frozen meals delivered straight to your door. They're ready in just two minutes. So all you have to do is heat them up and enjoy. They're an amazing way to eat any kind of meal. If you're ready to, if you're you're looking away for a way to to get yourself ready for your next day and prepping up, meal prepping, uh, cooking meals for yourself, it's so much easier just to go to Factor and let them do all of the cooking, all of the prepping. And like I said, just not having to clean up after it makes it so much easier. You can go to factormeals.com slash rising250 and use code rising250 for 50% off. That's code rising250. That's R-I-S-I-N-G-T-O-5-0 at factormeals.com slash rising250 and get 50% off. 
that's an amazing deal, guys. And like I said, it's an amazing service. Uh, I've used Factor in the past, and they have some really good meals. Uh, and, and just looking at, at everything that they offer, they're all very healthy meals. They're, they're chef-made meals. So you can go to factormeals.com slash rising250. That lets them know that we sent you. And again, use that code rising250 and get yourself 50% off. That's an amazing way to save money this holiday season. And also it helps you save time and, and save on just about everything this holiday season. So go to rising or sorry, go to factor.com slash rising two fifty and use code rising two fifty for fifty percent off. It doesn't get much better for that. Uh, and and they're amazing meals. Uh, and I know they're gonna be sending us some meals to try out uh, to a little bit more of their product. Uh, just a huge thanks to them for sponsoring this episode. But before we get too much further into everything, of course, we've got the man, the myth, the legend finally joining us in from Mobile, Alabama. Blake, how you doing, man? What is up, guys? I'm glad to be on. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad to have I haven't done that in forever, dudes. I got to do it once. Yeah, we're finally, we're finally back together. Uh, just got done talking some Auburn football and the 2024 uh, schedule release for the Southeastern Conference. And welcome to the SEC, Josh. Uh, yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, I, I saw yeah. you kind of picking on my Sooners and just picking on us how bad we have our, <laughs> our schedule set up for next season, man. I'm I'm not looking forward to how tough the schedule is for the fact that it's going to be tough to get past it. But looking at everything, man, it, it's really fun. Uh, looking at the college football world right now and everything that's going into it and, and seeing, I guess, with the transfers, with the the recruiting and everything that Oklahoma's going through, the scariest thing I think for Oklahoma right now is we lost our literally our entire offensive line. We had dudes either transfer out or going on to the NFL, uh, all, all five of them. So that, that's something that I'm, I'm kind of a little worried about because when you go into the SEC, it's more about your defense, and I know that, but your offensive line is your offense. Without an offensive line, you don't have an offense. So that's a little bit scary to kind of look at. But I, I got I got faith in, in Coach B. He's been with Oklahoma forever and seeing everybody that he's – He's put together. He's put together guys like Trent Williams, Orlando Brown, big time dudes in the in the NFL right now. So uh, I got all the faith in the world in him and what he's capable of. Um, but man, I'm, I'm excited. Uh, and and I was I was looking into the prices too. You know what the lowest price I could find on that Auburn Oklahoma game was? Uh, what is that? Just just take a ballpark guess. Uh, it's probably going to be around two hundred bucks. Four hundred and forty dollars is the lowest price I could find right now. <laughs> so Man. we may we may be i mean unless we can find some special okay. deal uh we may Look, be uh looking wow. for a, for a different game <laughs> josh this this isn't the big 12 anymore brother yeah i know uh, i know man yeah this is uh people people care about it down here and and they're uh they're they're psychotic about the college football world down here man and uh Look, I, I'm I'm so excited about Oklahoma and Texas. I love to take little digs because you are new to the conference, and um, you know all the times that we hear the SEC chants and the bowl games, and now you get you guys get to actually play the schedule uh, week in and week out, and it's just not a bowl game, you know. So yeah. uh, I'm excited, man. I think it's going to be awesome. Like I was just telling Dustin, like getting the chance to go out to Oklahoma and to go out to Texas and uh, just Norman and Austin and everything that comes with it and the traditions and stuff, man, it's, it's going to be awesome. And um, I'm excited for next year. And, and not only, not only for football too, it's also for basketball, uh, baseball. baseball. We were also yeah. like, like you can even look at, you can even look at golf, all right? Softball. Like college golf, softball. I mean, I mean like, adding, is, adding Oklahoma and Texas to softball, is really big. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I, I even told Dustin this a while ago. I was like, dude, you can even look at gymnastics, like yeah. uh, cheerleading. Definitely. Like, I mean, just anything you really want to look at, adding these two prestigious universities uh, to our conference. I'm excited. I know I know a couple people I, I said on Twitter this morning, uh, I, I said, you know, like, I don't know about you, but I'm excited about it. Like, yeah. I'm stoked. And some people are like, oh, I'm not stoked. Like, that's stupid. They need to go back to the Big 12. And I'm just like, eh, I like it, you know? Well, see, and I think a lot of SEC teams are acting as if Oklahoma and Texas didn't prepare themselves for this. I think both teams mm -hmm. have done really, really well getting themselves ready for the SEC. 
Uh, and and that's that's something like I, I was I was excited when it first came out. We're going over to the SEC because it's the SEC. Why wouldn't you be excited? But then I realized it's going to be a tougher schedule. That's a little <laughs> nerve wracking. And then we lose Lincoln Riley. The way that we lost him, not just losing him, but the way that we lost him, man, that hurt. Uh, and we we talked about that the other night. And then you get Brent Venables in. You're feeling a little more confident. But the first year, man, you let up over 30 points a game. Your defense looked atrocious. And you're not sure how to feel as an Oklahoma fan. But then you turn around. You're looking way better on both sides of the ball right now. Just an overall balanced team. And really the two losses, you can really put on the offensive side of the ball. Because the defense didn't do bad. Uh, and, and a lot of people want to look at stats and, and the stats don't tell the whole story. When you actually pay attention to the game, most of those, those yards being given up because the defense is either on the ball, on, on the field too much and or the fact that they're put into their own territory. So, I mean, just overall, I'm, I'm really excited, and I think we've made a lot of really big moves in the transfer portal so far, and especially when you look over on the defensive side of the ball, what we're able to put together, bringing back uh, Communion himself. Uh, and then also Billy <laughs> Bowman, a couple of dudes. Um, I'm really excited to have them both added uh, to the, back to the defensive side of the ball. Uh, I guess since we're talking about the co- college football right now, let's go ahead and jump into our college football part of, of what we're going to talk about tonight um, because we have a judge's ruling favoring NCAA players that are seeking a second transfer. And I kind of wanted to get you guys' take on this and, and a little bit of your, your opinion because this is one that – I, I personally, I feel a little bit, a little bit split on, um, but this is the article that I saw from ESPN pop up. It says that college athletes who were denied the chance to play immediately after transferring a second time can return to competition for now after a federal judge issued a 14 day temporary restraining order Wednesday against the NCAA U S district judge, John Preston Bailey in Northern West, West Virginia issued the order against the NCAA from enforcing the transfer rule. A lawsuit filed by West Virginia and six other states alleged the rules waiver process uh, violated federal antitrust law. And then it goes on to say a hearing uh, on the restraining order is scheduled for December 27th. Uh, And then the NCAA didn't immediately indicate whether it would appeal the ruling. NCAA rules allow underclassmen to transfer once without having to set out a year but an additional transfer as an undergraduate generally requires the NCAA to grant a waiver allowing the athlete to compete immediately. Without it, the athlete would have to sit out for a year at the new school. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll kind of stop there. The, the article goes on to talk a lot more about this uh, kind of overall and then the ruling itself. And then I also saw something else that popped up later on today that actually talked about how, how transfers who would uh, c- complete this restraining order, uh, p- p- compete during this restraining order uh, period, would lose their eligibility if the decision is reversed. So, you know, with with, uh, with us understanding the, the decision, so you can look at certain players and, uh, you know, uh, who, what was the North Carolina wide receiver this past year? Do you remember? Uh, Tez Walker or something like yeah, that. Or, yeah, Tez Walker. Yeah. Uh, you know, with, with Devontae Walker and seeing him, he wasn't able to compete because he was an underclassman that transferred and transferred again. Uh, you know, so he said he transferred several times. That's one of the outliers. And and I'll leave him out because if you see the reason why he transferred, you see, you know, everything around that story showed he should have been able to play. And we talked about that on this show, man. It was it was despicable that the NCAA was keeping him out of of playing for North Carolina this past season. But, you know, there's there's other guys, man, that, that that keep on transferring and transferring. Personally, I feel like the transfer portal has become way too much and way, way more hectic than it needs to be. And it's just feeling like the NFL junior leagues. Uh, and, and so personally, I look at this uh, and, and I think I, I think the NCAA should have a say and should have to waive that player being able to being able to transfer and play right away. Um, but then sometimes I feel like they just don't get it right. So I can understand both sides of the argument. Uh, Blake, I'll start off with you, man. How, how are you feeling about this? Uh, you know, with the, I, I guess, a, a judge kind of stepping in and trying to sue against the NCAA and to tell them that they're not allowed to to withhold these guys from from transferring. And, and kind of where do you where, where do you stand on the whole double transfers 
uh, as an undergraduate? Um, I think you should only get one transfer period. Uh, whether you're a graduate or undergraduate, whatever, uh, you should only get one transfer. Uh, like DJU, you transferred from <laughs> Clemson to Oregon State, and now you're going to what Florida State, Miami. You're going to take all these visits, and bro. You're literally traveling across the world uh, to to what? Like, there's no stability there. Um, I, I'm a transfer guy. I'm a fan of transferring uh, because I truly believe that. An 18-year-old kid can make a mistake, all right? An 18-year-old kid can walk into a college that he picked out of high school and say, hey, I, I made a mistake. I, I'm not a fit here. Um, I, I don't like this place. You know, like, I think that happens to some kids, all right? And no matter how bad you want a kid to, you know, grow roots and, and work hard and all this, sometimes they just don't they just don't adapt to the, you know, to the culture that's at that school, you know? Um, but I think you should have to sit down and really do your homework of where you want to transfer next. And you get one shot. And if it doesn't work out there, then guess what? It's not ring around the rosy and you get to pick wherever you want to go in the country and you get to keep doing it and keep doing it. No, you get one shot. You get one transfer opportunity. And you better make the best of it. My man Bo Nix transferred to the University of Oregon and he made the best of it. All right. Uh, we had a tight end, Landon King. He transferred to the to uh, the University of Utah. He made the best of his opportunity. He got on the field last year. Uh, caught some balls, scored a couple touchdowns, had a great year, all right? Transferring, in my opinion, is not always about they don't they they don't want to compete or, 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 you know, they lack competition with other people or whatever. Um, I, th I think, like I said, I think an 18-year-old kid can make a mistake in where they choose to go to school, uh, but – I'm on the. I'm also on the thing like Cam Ward. He he's now looking for his third school, and apparently he's going to Miami. So he went from FCS to Washington State. Okay, well, guess what? I hate it for you, brother, but you only had one more year at Washington State. Play your last year there, and that's it. And now he's transferring across the country to Miami. So like. I'm just not a fan of that, man. Uh, but I am a huge transfer portal guy. I'm a huge NIL guy. Um, I believe in in all of it. I think players deserve to get paid. But I'm kind of to the point where the transfer portal has become NFL free agency and a pay-to-play type thing where yeah. these, these guys are going around and saying, well, I'm not coming on a visit unless you give me a million dollars. And so – Okay, look at Texas A&M. They're falling apart right now because they gave all these kids all that money. And now they're all hitting the transfer portal because Jimbo got fired. They were losing games. They couldn't win, and it's a disaster now. So that's where I sit on it. Um, I think allowing a kid to transfer twice is a bad move, man. I'm not a fan of it, uh, even as a, as a graduate. Now, if you want to pull a Drew Pine, from Arizona State and transfer back to Notre Dame uh, to get your your grad degree or whatever, uh, that that's cool. I'm fine with that. But if you're transferring all over the country just to play football, I'm out of here with that. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm right there with you, man. I just feel like the you know even even NIO because again, I'm right there. I'm, I'm I'm on the same page as you. I'm, I'm all for NIO. I think NIO is a great thing. I don't yep. think you should have to go in and, and not be able to get paid for your name, image, and likeness. But all of it, it feels like it's just gone overboard and there hasn't been enough stipulations, which if you guys know me, I'm not for more rules and more stipulations being put on things. But when it comes to this stuff, it just feels like it, it's been going overboard. But Jeremy, where do you, where do you stand on, on kind of all of this NIL and specifically on the transfer, uh, having, you know, being able to transfer several times, uh, where do you stand on that? 
I mean, I, I, you guys both said the best. I'm right there with you guys. I mean, it's one thing to transfer them one time, but you get these individual players. Like, I understand you may not see the field a whole bunch of times. I completely understand that. But at the end of the day, if you transfer to more than more than two schools, I look at that situation. I think, okay, maybe he's not getting enough playing time, but he's getting his name out, and it's – Honestly, getting ridiculous to the point to where you keep hearing about nothing against any players, but you get your name out there and you get in that same rhythm where, oh, I'm back in the spotlight. I'm transferring here. At the same time, I don't really care where you're going just because you you make yourself look – you make your school that you were just recently at look like a joke in my opinion just because you want to try and get your name out there and – you had nothing better to do, in my opinion, but you just need to actually stick with what Father Blake just said and actually stick your foot in the ground and actually do the work and actually – I shouldn't say Father Blake because he was starting to sound like Eminem since you only get one shot. And um, <laughs> I mean, I mean, realistically, at the end of the day, just, st- just be smart and actually just do the right thing and just – Flat out be better. I'm, I'm glad you caught that too because whenever he said, you got one shot, I almost jumped in and cut him off and said, you got one opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Mm. No, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm glad that all, all of us agree. I mean, it's it's just crazy looking at all of this you know, and seeing. And this is this is another petition where our, our listeners need to start a petition uh, where, you know, you all three of us and then, of course, the guys that we've allowed, and I've, I've even mentioned this on on uh, X, Twitter, whatever you want to call it, here recently, you know, adding guys like like David Cohn and the Crane brothers uh, onto that. Uh, that, and then I think uh, Josh Pate would be another guy to add to that that committee. You know, we need to be the committee that takes over the NCAA and the playoff committee and just about everything with college football. I think we would make college football great again. Uh, to take that from Donald Trump himself, but we would make it great again. And it would be huge. All right. It would be absolutely huge. The biggest thing you've ever seen. It would be oh huge. My God, but this guy. Huge. <laughs> huge. <laughs> but guys, let's jump over to the NBA. We haven't really talked a whole lot about the NBA other than, I guess, the in season tournament, which I-, I will admit, I think the in season tournament was pretty exciting. Seeing the new courts, I think that was a new, I guess, as- aesthetically pleasing uh, to the eye, just being able, being able to see something new being added to it. And then you could also decipher between just a normal playoff game or I guess a normal in season game and then the uh, in season playoff game. So that, that was a lot of fun to be able to see that. And we talked a little bit about the courts and uh, kind of more about that in season tournament, but let's talk about first Draymond green. Uh, if you guys saw the replay of him and it just seems like this is a reoccurring thing with him, but now the NBA has come out. So he, he got suspended uh, the other night for really hitting another another guy in the face, and then now the NBA suspends him indefinitely. So this is a little bit different with his previous suspensions, which just seems like it happens way too often with him. But now it's indefinitely, so we don't really know when he's going to come back. First, uh, I mean, Blake, let's start off with you, man. I mean, how do you feel about Draymond Green? Did he deserve to be suspended? And then on top of that, indefinitely, how do you feel about this decision by the NBA to kind of suspend him, and especially with it being this type of suspension? Get him out the league, man. Like, I'm tired. Of, I'm tired of seeing it for real. Like, I don't. I don't know. Like, it's it's just. It's like he doesn't learn his lesson. You know, it 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 goes all the way back to when he kicked LeBron and you know in the midsection uh, in the finals and cost his team a championship. You know, he got suspended for game five and you know had to sit out and all that stuff. I think it was game five, or game six, something like that. Yeah, um, one of the two. Yeah, he had he had to sit out and everything, and and uh, you know Cleveland come back and from three one and won the championship and. He's still doing stuff like this, like calling KD, you know, the name on the on the bench and everything. Him and KD getting into it a couple of years ago, and punching KD his said, own teammate in the face, you know, Jordan Poole. Yeah, yeah, and, and KD said that like that was the reason he didn't come back to uh, Golden State was because of Draymond, and um, yeah, the Jordan Poole incident and all that. Like they were just talking trash and everything, and 
like you hit the dude and especially like he wasn't even really looking at you and and i mean it's just it's just reoccurring things man and i'm kind of tired of him like he's kind of a clown man like i used to like draymond like i used to back him and everything like Mm -hmm. dude like he's a grinder bro like he's dirty on the glass like he gets rebounds and everything but now I'm just kind of like, man, get him out the league. Like, I don't want to see that. You know, I'm tired of hearing his name. He's a nobody now. And uh, I think Steph's getting kind of fed up with it too. So, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not big on, on Draymond anymore, man. Yeah, I mean, we had a chance here uh, to, to kind of see him leave the Warriors. And if he leaves the Warriors, not many teams were super interested in him. And so the fact that they signed him back too, just kind of giving mm-hmm. him another chance with that same team. Uh, and, and I'm right there with you, too. I, I used to love Draymond coming out of Michigan State, seeing how he was a dirty player in a good way because he got physical down low, but making a play on the ball. Things like this, if you see that, he he said he didn't mean to, but not only the way that he hit him, the way that he hit him, it was absolutely intentional, and intentional that he turned around and hit the dude in the face. And then the way that he reacted afterwards as if he just saw him on the ground and just kind of walked away, didn't really do much like, oh, man, I'm so sorry. The way that you would if you did really didn't mean to, and so I mean, I, Jeremy, I, I'm I'm kind of right there with Blake, man. I'm just kind of tired of seeing this from Draymond, and, and personally, I'm I'm happy that the NBA is taking an indefinite suspension on him, but hopefully, it it comes to more than just this. I agree. I mean, every, everybody's seen the incident. There's if you say that's accidental, I'm gonna call you out and say you're full of you know what. <laughs> I mean, realistically, if I'm glad the NBA is doing what they're what they're doing here because I'm in the same boat. I liked Draymond back in the day. Then now looking at Draymond, like if I see the Golden State Warriors on TV, I'll maybe look at it for a split second. Then, then after that, I'll honestly turn the channel just because I've I I haven't liked Draymond since since the incident with KD. I mean that was just unorthodox. That was uncalled for, flat out. Then Draymond, I, I've talked about this before. You get other NBA players, and you look at little kids or teenagers or whatever age group, you look up to those guys, and they're making millions upon millions of dollars. And in this situation, Draymond Green is just flat out pissing all those dollars away. Now, I want to actually watch basketball to watch a full team roster put in a full effort than watch, as Blake said, the best, watch a clown just out there and just – pull that kind of a stunt there's there's no need for any of that and i'm glad the nba is doing what they're doing and i I think i think they should just let him go and he's just be cut out of the league yeah yeah i mean absolutely i mean it's just it's crazy to see this and and just with one player and it's just something that's habitual Uh, and so it's just kind of crazy that it keeps on going on with him and and like you said blake just the fact that it feels like he just never learns from Mm -hmm. mistakes and that's now what this game is if, if you want to hit people in the face and punch people, then you Go should go hockey. over to UFC, which uh, let's go ahead and move on over to it. Let's talk about UFC this weekend. I'm actually really excited for one uh, kind of getting together with with my dad and, and, and being able to see, see it with him and, uh, and and you know, being able to go over there and, and kind of watch some of the UFC fights because I was really excited about this card, looking at this card and seeing everything that's on it. Uh, there's a lot to it. Uh, first, Ian Gary out with pneumonia. You can call it maybe a, a little bit of a getting scared of, of fighting in the UFC anymore because he's kind of been called out for what he really is. Maybe um, that that's one thing. I think there's a lot of, a lot of fans kind of talking about that, but if he really is down with pneumonia, hopefully he gets better. I, it, he looked like a fighter that had a lot of potential when he first made his appearance into the UFC. Uh, and, and hopefully he can kind of work his way back into, to what he really originally looked like he had the potential to do um but the main card looking like it's going to be edwards against covington a welterweight title match that's one that i I look at that i think that's a lot of fun to to see uh and and just kind of everything that goes into into those title matches but uh leon edwards colby covington a couple of really good fighters uh right now it looks like uh leon edwards obviously is the favorite to win this matchup um blake who do you got in this this title match here for the welterweight uh i'm gonna go with leon man uh colby i'm not a big colby guy um i like colby jack cheese but that's about it i think he's a phony man (laughs) (laughs) 
I think he's a phony dude. Like, I think he does it all for clicks and show. And a great fighter. Great fighter. But uh, I think Leon's hot right now. And uh, Yes. Yeah, I, th- I think Leon – I think Leon can uh, can get Colby. I mean, you know, Colby's damn good, man. But yeah, give me Leon. I'm a, I'm gonna go Leon. I I'm on the fence on that, man. But yeah, I, I'm just not a Colby fan. I, I'm I'm right there with you, man. I'm on the fence because I think Colby is also on the same same level of of where he's heated up and he's he's really hot right now too. Um, but. I just don't see with their, their their fighting styles. I'm I'm leaning towards Leon Edwards. I I don't know if this one goes to a KO, possibly a TKO, where the ref has to step in. But ultimately, I'm seeing this one possibly go the distance, and it's going to come down to a decision. So I'm going to lean lean Leon Edwards. I don't know, uh, you know, where this this one could go, and and even even when you talk to submissions too, uh, just outside of that realm, but. I think it's going to go the distance. I'm, I'm going to take Leon Edwards to win this one. Jeremy, where are you standing? I'm I'm the same boat with you guys, but I think it's going to I think it's going to be a quick one. I think um, really for all we know, I think it, I think it's going to go between. I think it's going to go in the second round. I think it might be done then and there, but I'm on the I'm on the I'm on the fence, but I'm still sticking with Leon as well, just because. I mean, don't get me wrong; they're both good fighters, but at the mm-hmm. end of the day, I think. Edwards is just I think he's got enough in the tank just to get the job done. Yeah, I'm there with you. Did you did you have something to like? Um uh, my buddy just texted me and said that um like they were Leon and Kobe were talking uh during the press or whatever and Kobe told Leon that he was gonna take him to the seventh layer of hell and Leon responded and said, Okay, and Kobe responded back and said, We can visit your dad while we were there. Um, oh, Leon said that to Colby? No, Colby said that to Ooh. Leon. Oh, never mind. Yeah, I'm, wow. I'm I'm definitely seeing this. I don't know whether it's going to be a submission or a TKO, but I'm kind of I'm kind of on uh Wow. Man, that's that's pretty dark. Uh, I yeah, mean, bro, that's why I don't like him. That's yeah, I, I mean it's it, I'm I'm right there with you. I don't like him. I I think he's a really good fighter though. Uh it, it's kind of like you know, I don't I don't know. Like I I can understand why people don't like Conor McGregor. I personally love Conor McGregor, but he doesn't he doesn't go too far with his comments to like that. I don't know talking about talking about somebody's dead, especially their dead father, yeah. and I'm not, I'm not cool with that. Yeah, I'm not yeah, and, and talking about smart. in that in that sense, I'm not cool with that. Um, yeah. So personally, if that's me, if 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 I were in the, in that in that situation, and you're talking about my dad, my dad passed away, and you're going to talk about my dad like that, I'm knocking you out. And it's going to be quick, so I'm, I might be right there with with, with Jeremy now, uh, seeing yeah. that because I, I get it. I think a lot of the, the, that talk is just talk. You're just trying to get in each other's head, but you you done pissed me off way too far now, and, and so I'm, I'm leaning even even harder for Leon now. I like Leon too. I think he's a really good fighter. I think he's solid on just about every aspect of his of his game. So I'm I'm gonna lean his way. I'm gonna be right there with Jeremy now, and I think I'm rooting for him more to end it in like the first or second round. Because no personally, that, that's too far to me. No doubt. No but, doubt. But uh, let's go on to the next one. We've got uh, Shevkat Ram Rock Rachmanov. I've got to say the name right. Uh, and I had I practiced it before you guys got on too, and I still messed it up. Uh, but Shuk- Shavkat Rachmanov <laughs> uh, against uh, Stephen Thompson. Uh, obviously, I think this is an easy one that goes towards Shakvat, uh, and 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 I think he's got this fight, and I don't think it's it's a, without a doubt. But I like seeing him fight, and I think he's a really good fighter. Uh, so personally, I'm going with him. I think he ends it pretty quick. But I, I like watching him fight, and I think this will still be a fun one to watch. But one of those fun ones to watch, just because I think it leans so far one way. Um, but Jeremy, how are you feeling? I'm in the same boat as you, but I'm not going to try and butcher his last name. Um, I th- I think Rachmanov. it's going gonna... to. I know how to say his last name too, Rachmanov, but I, I don't know why. I, I couldn't say. I can't say his first name and se- and the last name together to save my life. <laughs> okay, hats so off, hats off to, to Joe and and the dudes over there uh, saying all these these fighters' names like nothing because there's a lot of dudes from different different regions around the world and and they're they're. Yeah. I think they're some of the best too. Really, all of them: uh, Cormier, 
uh, and then uh, Ario, uh, he's another dude that's really good stepping in there and, and just the way that they commentate on fighting too. And they have their own personal experiences, which obviously gives them an advantage in that, but they're really quick on their, their calls, uh, catching exactly what it is. Cause there's certain, certain holds that fighters get in where it's hard to see that right away, but they're seeing that from ringside and being able to make those calls a huge shout out to them. I think they're some of the best commentators ever. And then the excitement that goes into it too. I know. I mean, it just, it's just one thing or just to see the fight and just get that much energy rolling. But just even for the main guard, just hearing Bruce Buffer, I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't absolutely. know what more you can you really ask for. But, yeah, I'm going for Rachmanov. The, I think his style of fighting, I think, is going to definitely play a, a big effect against Thompson. But at the end of the day, like I said, I'm sticking with Rachmanov. Then I think it's going to be – I think this might be another quick one. But if not, I think it's – if it doesn't, I think it's definitely going to be obvious. It's going to be a TKO decision. Absolutely, Blake. How you feeling? Um, quick and easy. Uh, get it over with. Um, I mean, it's all pointing to him. Yeah, honestly. It, you know, UFC. We don't talk about it enough, uh, just because it's it's one of those those sports that kind of gets shoved under the rug. But it's it's kind of, I think for all three of us, kind of a one of those guilty pleasure sports where. We don't talk about it as much, but when, when you really oh, get okay. down to it, man, I, I, I go, I might go harder into a UFC, UFC card and like just an overall than I would like in my own, you know, for, for an Oklahoma Sooners football game. Like, I, I don't know. It's just, it's just, it, it's, it's a sport I've, I've gotten into b- between wrestling whenever I was in school uh, and then getting into MMA a little bit, trying to, trying to work my way into that. That was too much for me to take anything further than than headgear. Uh, so, I mean, it's it's just one of those sports that until you compete in it, you don't understand why it's so fun to watch two dudes beat the living crap out of each other. Um, but and I, I think that's another thing just with with men and our testosterone level and just the their overall, you know, certain men have a, a higher warrior call within them, I guess you want to call it, uh, where just watching that sport is so fun, uh, so fun to watch. And one of the most exciting fighters to watch is Patty the Batty, Patty Bimblet, Pimblet, uh, and seeing him, the Irish boy, uh, come on over and fight here in, in UFC 296. He's going to go against Tony Ferguson. This one, I, I mean, right now I'm, I'm looking at the odds, and Patty the Batty is sitting there at minus 310. I think that's extremely high odds because Tony Ferguson yeah. isn't a dude to mess around with. I wouldn't be surprised if Tony walked away with this fight. Um, but personally, I, I think just the fact that Patty is just such a mouthy dude, he's kind of like a, a like a squirrely Conor McGregor. <laughs> I don't know if I, if I put it that way, just a, a squirrely Conor McGregor, the way that he, he's running his mouth nonstop. And it's like, it, it's very natural with him. I think it must be an Irish thing. Uh, just kind of natural with him, just the way that he, he bad mouths just about everybody out there. I'm rooting for Patty just because I think he's a fun, fun fighter to watch. But I'm not sure that this is going to be an easy fight for him, and I don't know if he walks away with this. I'm going to pick Batty just because I'm, I'm a homer. I'm going to go for him. But I think this might go a little further than uh, – I, I think right now it was sitting right around two and a half rounds. Uh, I'm, I'm going to pick this to go further than that. I think it goes over the two and a half rounds uh, in, into that third round, and it's going to go the distance just because it's it's two really good fighters, and I think they're both – they both have a fighting style that goes and, and combats against each other. Um, but Blake, how are you feeling about Patty the Batty against Tony Ferguson? Come on, Tony! Come on, man! <laughs> Bring me home! Bring me home! I don't. I'm not big on Patty either, man. Like I'm not a fan. Uh, I think he's like a wannabe, a wannabe Conor McGregor. Uh, See, and- I, I don't, I don't like that. I mean, I've heard a lot of people call him that, and and I think it's just I'm, when when I see him. I've seen him on camera in in different situations. I think that's just his personality, personally. And, and so I, I can under, I can understand where people think that. I think Connor's just the first big time Irish dude to come over and and show his his true colors personally. Yeah, it might be uh, like how they how they do things over there or whatever. But I'm just uh, I don't know. I don't think he's that great of a fighter either. Like prove it to me. He Saturday. just he just swings his fist so fast and and so aggressively, dude. Like I mean, that's that's just about it with his fighting style. He just doesn't care where it's going to land. He just wants to hit you. And 
if it drops you, then he's happy. And that's about it. I'm waiting to see that chin too. I, I want to see that chin get tested this week. Yeah, I mean, so. honestly, I, I'm not. I, I won't be surprised. I think. I think for. I think Tony's. Tony's a very uh, articulate fighter. I think he's very, very specific on on how he's going to attack, and th- that's why he's such a good fighter. Uh, and so that's why I think he stands a very good chance. I think. I think t- taking the the money line on him to win this fight would be a pretty good bet just because I think he has a very good chance of winning this one against Patty, who I think just goes in there fists of rage, just flying all over the, the octagon. And he's just going to try to drop you. Uh, and he's not really, he's not really that, that, that same style of fighter as Tony Ferguson. I agree, brother. Uh, sorry. I've had a <laughs> long week. Uh, I'm, I'm right there with you, dude. I was just telling but, uh, Jeremy before we started and then even, as we started, I was like sitting there trying to wake myself up. I'm, I'm finally awake now, but man, I was I was struggling here in the beginning of this episode. Yeah, man, I've I've had a long week, a lot going on, and uh, yeah, but the UFC card, man, I'm excited for it. Um, I'm excited for this fight. I just I really want Tony, and you know, Tony's getting he's getting up in age, man, and and uh, you know, you don't really know how much left he's you know he's got in the tank. So mm-hmm. uh, that's another reason why I'm I'm really pulling for him. Jeremy, how are you feeling about this fight? I'm I'm honestly going with with Tony here just because Blake said the best. That's what I was just going to say. Who knows how much he has left in the tank here. But another thing to point out for about Patty the Batty, I mean, you may have your you may have your punches just flailing around like a chicken with your head cut off in this situation, but if you're if you don't get yourself careful, you're going to get got in one of those punches and then your your butt's going to be hitting the floor here. So Realistically, I think I think Ferguson's going to take it over Patty the Batty, in my opinion. Yeah, you can't get got if you're the one that's got getting got, as Medea <laughs> would say. So, uh, just looking oh at that, gosh. man. I mean, mm-hmm. <laughs> no, I, I I like that too. I like that you know we, we kind of broke that up because I feel like the first two fights we all three kind of agreed with each other, kind of breaking this one up a little. And really looking at the rest mm-hmm. of the, the 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 fights on this card too, I think this is a card. That shows a lot of excitement with some of the some of the people that you won't know their names as much, but uh, looking, I, I think these three fights, and then I think the Ian Gary fight was one I was kind of looking forward to. So I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm disappointed that he's not going to be able to fight. Uh, hopefully he gets better, but I, I really want to see more of Ian Gary uh, in, in seeing him because uh, the last fight that I remember him fighting in it was just really disappointing. I think he won that fight, but it didn't really Couldn't feel like finish. he won it. Yeah, he didn't finish off. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that's kind of, I think you and I were talking about that, Blake, uh, you know, how he just really didn't finish it, that, that fight off. Uh, and so I want to see more of him. I want to see him come out and have a fight that he's more deserving of. And, uh, and another dude that I'm, I'm extremely excited about just coming back and I always am, and I always will be is Connor. Uh, you know, I'm seeing Connor come back in the octagon. I, I don't know how anyone can root against Connor. I, I can understand how people could bet against him. Uh, you know, and, and, and that makes sense because if you're just betting with your your brain rather than your heart, but he's he's a man of the people, uh, and I, I think he's he's one of those dudes that's just hard to root against. But uh, that's pretty much all we got there. But guys, let's jump over to our DraftKings bets. We are betting with DraftKings uh, this month, and we're going with DraftKings because they are one of really all three of our our favorite sports books to go with. DraftKings is an amazing way to bet on all of your sports. If you're looking for a sports book. DraftKings is the way to go. You can go to rising2.com slash, slash DraftKings. That's R-I-S-I-N-G-T-O dot com slash DraftKings. All one word. Go there, bet $5, and get $150 in bonus bets when you sign up. This promotion may vary by your location, but DraftKings is one of the best sports books to go by. I'll start us off with our DraftKings bets. We're going with three bets because we didn't do it last episode. That was my fault. I forgot to lead us into that and get everybody ready for it. So we're going to go with three bets and kind of double down on it a little bit here in the next couple of episodes uh, to kind of get us caught up on this month. But we've got uh, first, I'm going to go with Gonzaga plus five versus Yukon. I was looking at that one. That's a minus 110. I was looking at that one. I think Gonzaga has a pretty good chance to win that game. So I think plus five is a pretty... Uh, pretty easy one for me to take there. I'm going to take them there uh, in college basketball. And then I'm also going to take Sam Houston minus five versus Texas State. I like them beating Texas State pretty comfortably. Uh, and then a third one, I messed up and actually did a Thursday night game for here for the for the NFL. But I had to change it uh, and end up going with the Coyotes. 
I'm going to take them minus one and a half against the San Jose Sharks. That's a plus 114. I like the odds on that because the San Jose Sharks, as Jeremy and I both know, are looking like booty cheeks this year. So I like the Coyotes uh, beating them over there too. So those are my three picks for tonight. Kind of trying to double down. Jeremy, let's go over with you. What's your DraftKings bets for Friday night? My DraftKings bets, I'm sticking with the good old NHL here. My first one, I have the money line for the Boston Burns versus the New York Islanders. And I'm flipping the script. I'm pulling a Pat McAfee here. I am pulling for the New York Islanders. Let's go. I'm picking for the New York Islanders money line here. I know. Like I said, we're at the top of the hour. The odds for the the Boston Burns, it's – no, because you, because you said you're 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 taking the Islanders to money line. Yeah, I'm picking the Islanders money line here. Uh, what was that sitting? Looking at, at it, uh, it is currently sitting at plus one ten and minus one thirty for the Boston Bruins. Dang! So you're you're taking the plus one ten on on the. Islanders. I'm taking the like plus. I'm taking the plus one ten here just because, like I said at the top of the hour, after watching the. Boston Bruins the other night against the New Jersey Devils. The Boston Bruins took that nice L in that situation. And to me, they just didn't look like the normal Boston Bees that we've seen. But for my second bet, I picked the over-under for the Dallas Stars and the Ottawa Senators here. And I'm picking the under on this one at minus 125, which is sitting at 6.5. Then. I think this is definitely going to be a good one, but I don't necessarily think that it's going to be a high-scoring game. But obviously, I I easily could be wrong just because we can never know in this in this day and age in the NHL. Then looking at my final one, I have the um, I have the over under again for the Las Vegas Golden Knights versus the Buffalo Sabers, and for that one, I'm picking the under as well, and that is sitting at minus one twenty two here. So. The, I know we always talk about the Vegas Golden Knights being at the top of the whole NHL here, but I think this is definitely going to be a closer one than we expect. So that's my three bets. Blake, what do you got in this situation? Uh, give me a UConn money line on that UConn-Gonzaga game. Um, so you're so kind of going against me there a little bit because I, I feel like Gonzaga might be able to pull that off. Yeah, I, I just think UConn's a little too athletic, man. I'm not big on Gonzaga. Uh, when they play athletic teams, uh, I I just don't feel like Gonzaga recruits on on the blacktop uh, with fences around them. So, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, hey, <laughs> that is that's, are, I, I'm not I'm not arguing with you. I just think it's funny yeah. that you you pointed out the obvious. Uh, <laughs> I just feel like when they get up against a little better competition, man, they they get railed. Um, and then I'll go over here to the NBA, man. Um, I'm going to take the uh, the Pacers at the Wizards, minus eight and a half. Uh, I think the Wizards are an absolutely awful basketball team. Amen. Uh, they're, they're terrible. Um, and, uh, and then for my third one, wow, the 76ers are giving up 16 and a half. That's in, I mean, that's insane. It's crazy. Uh, in an NBA game, uh, give me the Lakers on the road minus six and a half at the Spurs. Uh, Wimbiana and the struggling Spurs at three and twenty. I like the Lakers, man. So, uh, yeah, my goodness, the Raiders are beating the Chargers twenty-one to nothing. Yeah, that Staples I saw that. don't have to pack his bags, brother. I saw that. I was I was pulling up some of these odds too. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's crazy. I and mean, we just started uh, in that game too. Right? <laughs> I mean, that's that's going to be an ugly one, but. Yeah, that, that is our DraftKings bets. Again, you can go to rising2.com slash DraftKings. That's R-I-S-I-N-G-T-O dot com slash DraftKings, all one word. If you get signed up with that link, you'll bet $5 and get $150 in bonus bets over on DraftKings. That promotion may vary by your location. It must be 21 or older to bet on DraftKings. But guys, that's all that we have for today. We thank you all so much for tuning in with us. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can give us a five-star review. Make sure to follow us on social media. We're on X, formerly known as Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all of that fun stuff. So please go follow us over over there and help us out, uh, help us grow on social media and grow our social media platform. And then, of course, uh, if you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. You can also hit the like button and comment as well. All of that helps us beat the algorithm and helps us jump to the top of the list. So we thank you all so much for all of your love. And support. Until next time.